Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, today we will start with a new module uh, that is on severe plastic deformation. Uh, in the first few lectures uh, we discussed about uh, some no non-conventional deformation uh, thermomechanical uh, deformation processes nowadays which are coming up okay. and uh, the category in which they are uh, uh, put are ca called severe plastic deformation. Okay. So, as the name suggests uh, the amount of deformation or amount of strain which you can put in the material is very high as compared to our conventional thermomechanical processing uh, like rolling, forging, extrusion and so on. Okay. So, the idea of uh, deformation itself is different than what we do in case of conventional thermomechanical processing. There the primary strain is comp uh, compression. Okay. So, basically all the conventional thermomechanical processing is based on the compression of the sample or they want to impose a strain in form of compressive strain. Okay. Uh, we do not do any thermomechanical processing using tensile strain. Okay. Uh, the reason is simple that when you apply tensile stresses, okay, if any defect is there it is going to open up. If you uh, remember your basic uh, fracture mechanics uh, uh, idea. Okay. Whereas, if you compress th the sample, okay, uh, you close the defect. So, compression is the primary mechanism of deformation in conventional thermomechanical processing. In severe plastic deformation, the primary deformation mechanism is through shear process. Okay. And because you are in, in shear mode, okay, you are able to apply much larger strain as compared to uh, in compression. Because whenever you have compression, you also induce some tensile stresses and some cracking will take place if you apply very large strain. Okay. But in shear, you are able to apply very large strain without inducing any uh, defect in the material, defect in the form of uh, cracking and so on other defect which are based on deformation processes like shear bands and flow localization may occur if you are doing at very high strain rates. Okay. So, in this category the first one to uh, what we are going to discuss today is called equal channel angular pressing. It is one of the most popular uh, technique to uh, impose very high uh, deformation. Okay. Uh, one of the first one to start uh, when when people started talking about severe plastic deformation. Okay, so the the process is very simple. All these processes are actually very simple. Okay, so in a equal channel angular pressing. Okay, basically you as as the name suggests, you have two chain. There are two channels, and these two channels are equal channel, and there is a angle to this channel. Okay. So, if you see this uh, uh, diagram here, okay, so this is my sample, okay. this is the plunger with which you are pressing the sample and if you see the die, okay, the, the die consists of this channel here okay, through which the sample is going to go and this cross sectional area of the channel and this cross sectional area of the channel okay, both are same. Okay, so, that is why they are equal and then there is an angle uh, in the channel. Okay. So, when the material goes and take a turn here, okay, you are imposing a very high amount of shear deformation in the material okay. and the deformation uh, shear deformation is in form of simple shear. Okay. So, you have intense plastic deformation uh, in, in form of simple shear. And these all these severe plastic deformation processes are they are usually used to produce ultra fine grain materials. Okay, what we also called as UFG. Okay, 
ultra fine grain. And uh, in ultra fine grain also there are two approaches uh, from down to up okay, and another is from top to down. So, this is a top to down approach where you have uh, coarse grain material okay, uh, relatively in bulk okay, and then you are deforming it and refining the microstructure. So, it is going from uh, coarse to fine. Okay. Uh, and as I told you that E cap die contains two channels okay, equal in cross section intersecting an angle near the center of the die. Okay. So, this is the uh, very very simple approach to, to the deformation process. Okay. If we want to look at the uh, uh, principle of the shearing process, okay. so if you look uh, uh, in the diagram, so you are uh, we are deforming the sample from the top. Okay, and one element is taken here which is called 1 here before the deformation okay. and this is my shear plane basically. So, and the element 2 is taken as after the deformation. Okay. So, if you see the element 1 okay, which is a shown as a rectangle plane here okay, and because of when, when it is going through when it is going through this angle here. Okay, what you are doing is you are applying a simple shear here okay, which is shown with these two arrows and when you look at the element 2 now the element 2 has deformed. Okay. So, now it has not remained a rectangle it has become a parallelogram okay, with a 45 degree angle here. Okay. So, the deformation here uh, has uh, taken this uh, a edge in front and this edge in the back that is how the deformation is taking place and because of that you have simple shear in the material. Okay. So, that is a very simple process like this okay, that how you can uh, uh, apply a shear uh, strain in the material. Now, uh, the complexities will uh, start coming in. Okay. So, we have to define a few uh, parameters for the die here. Okay. So, for example, uh, the die is shown here and there are two angles are shown here one is angle phi and another is angle psi. Okay. So, the phi angle is basically the intersection of the two channels. So, when the, where the two channels are meeting okay, if they are meeting at 90 degree okay, then of course, the angle will be a phi angle will be 90 degree or it can meet at, at some other angle okay, like this or it can meet an angle like this. Okay. So, this is these are bigger angle more than 90 degree. Okay. So, this angle phi will be more than 90 degree whereas, this angle phi will be less than 90 degree okay. and this is my 90 degree. So, th this is the intersection of the two channel that how they are intersecting at 90 degree more than 90 degree or less than 90 degree. The other angle is kind of uh, how uh, you, you are uh, you are giving a curvature to the whole deformation process. Okay, so you can have a very sharp curvature like this. Okay. Okay, but you can understand that material will not material is a solid material. It is not a fluid. Okay, which can occupy all the spaces available to it. Okay, so when you are deforming, the material will will not touch the very sharp edge of the die. Okay, it will deform something like this. Okay, so, what kind of uh, curvature we are providing okay, to have a smooth uh, deformation for the material. Okay. So, psi is the angle subtended by the arc of curvature at the point of intersection. Okay. So, at the point of intersection what is the, this angle psi okay, and what is this uh, basically this uh, curvature angle, what is the angle of this curvature at the intersection point okay, that defines the angle psi. So, these are the two important uh, uh, parameters of die design that what should be the angle phi and angle psi. Okay. And basically uh, the amount of strain which we are going to put in okay, depends on these two angles okay, with, with an equation as shown here. Okay. So, both angle phi and psi are coming uh, in, in the expression. Okay, and similarly, the n, n is basically the number of passes. So, if you keep uh, doing, so this is an equal channel uh, as you can understand. So, I can keep 
putting a strain in the material and it is there is no that is there, there is not going to be any change in the cross sectional area. So, there is no limit to the amount of strain I can put in the material. Whereas, if you do any rolling extrusion or this kind of processes, as you keep putting a strain in the material, for example, if you are doing rolling, it will the thickness of the material will keep reducing and after a certain point, okay, it is not possible uh, to put, put a strain in the material. Okay. So, if we, if we look at the our conventional thermomechanical processes like rolling, extrusion and so on, when you put the strain, their cross sectional area reduces. For example, if you take rolling, okay, if we when we put the strain, the thickness of the material keep reducing and after a certain point, you would not be able to apply any strain because the thickness has reduced to such an extent. By having a equal channel here, I can put any amount of strain in the material okay, uh, by continuously taking uh, through the die okay, and th that represents the number of uh, passes here. So, what is the effect of angle phi and psi? Okay. So, in terms of strain for example, uh, this is the uh, strain measured uh, uh, by doing uh, some grid methods okay. and the channel angle is on the x axis okay, the phi and uh, different curves are shown here for different psi angle. Okay. So, from 0 degree to 90 degree here. Okay. So, you can uh, see that for a very sharp angle that is psi 0 okay, uh, and at very low phi angle 60 degree means uh, the phi angle will be something like this this is 60 degree. Okay. So, it, it is a very extreme amount of strain you, you are putting if your die is like this okay, uh, something like this. Okay. Uh, so, the amount of strain is very high. Uh, in this this case okay and the n is only one that is only a single pass so in the single pass i can put in the strain of around uh, 2.6 or 2.7 okay very high strain so when you have a very sharp angle okay and psi is also 0 degree the strain is very high for the same 60 degree angle okay uh, 60 degree or i think 50 degree here if I reduce the psi that means, I start providing it a curvature, okay. the amount of strain goes from around 2.7 to around 1.4. Uh, so, a uh, substantial reduction in the strain level okay, just by changing the angle psi here. Okay. Usually, we do not use this kind of uh, angle phi okay, which are lower than 90 degree because uh, it will impose very high amount of uh, strain in the material okay, and it which can give rise to defects. Okay. Usually, if you see the phi angle in the literature, it is either 90 degree or more than 90 degree. Okay. So, if you go beyond 90 degree, the effect of angle psi actually start reducing. Okay. In fact, for very high angle like 120 degree and so on, uh, there is no effect of psi. Okay, so, usually the in the literature whatever you will find the angle phi is more than 90 degree. So, there the angle uh, psi angle has not much influence on the strain values okay. and if it has a no uh, effect on the strain value then of course, it would not have any much effect on the microstructure also. Okay. So, there are three four, four microstructures are also shown here for uh, phi angle more than 90 degree. So, 90 degree 112, 135 and 157 degree here. Okay. So, 90 degree is the one where we will you will have more strain as you can see from the figure. Okay. Whereas, for 157 degree the strain values will be much lower which, which are in the range of uh, what you get in conventional thermomechanical processing. So, around uh, 0.3 okay. whereas, in case of 90 degree it is around 1 uh, or more than that. Okay. So, the effect of a strain you can see on the microstructure that when you have 90 degree the strain is close to 1 here. Okay. I can see very nice recrystallized microstructure and very fine microstructure. Okay. As you can see the scale is 2 micron and the grains within that is uh, much finer than that. So, grain size must be around 1 micron or less than 1 micron. Okay. 
whereas if you keep increasing the angle here you see do not see any recrystallized microstructure as such ok. The grains are still uh, coarse ok and also they have lot of dislocation density present in the material ok. That means, it has not undergone uh, the recrystallization process or the recovery process is not very effective ok. So, you can see effect of the, fi uh, the, the die design on the microstructure ok for the same amount of strain that uh, if I have a sharper uh, or uh, smaller phi angle ok I would be able to impose higher strain and that will be seen in the microstructure ok. Now, there are different variants to the how we are going to do the friction uh, to, to how we are going to do the E cap process ok for because uh, I can change the direction of the shear strain ok. So, if I start with let us say some ingot here ok and let us say I can give them some name here for example, uh, let us call this as A, B, C and D ok. Now, suppose uh, as, as you can see in root A ok. Suppose this is my top a top uh, uh, the plane is a and the bottom plane is uh, of course it will be c then okay and I am doing one deformation so a will be on top c will be on bottom and again I am putting in the same configuration that a when it is going to come out a will be on top and c will be in the bottom then this will be a root a okay so I am not changing the 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 direction of the shear ok I am repeatedly doing in in one way ok. If you see this root B A, uh, A is in subscript here ok. In this case what you are doing is uh, that you are keep uh, you are alternating between the two two different planes ok. So, for example, in first case if it is A here and here it is C ok when you put it uh, back ok then and when it is coming out here then the B will be on top ok and of course, then D will be in the bottom ok. And again when you put the next time A will come on top and B will come uh, C will come in bottom ok. So, it is kind of alternating between this position and this position and again coming back to this position ok. So, the arrow shows that it you are again coming back to the first uh, configuration. Then you have a root B C ok. In this case you are co continuously changing the position of if this is my first uh, plane which is the A plane here ok. So, now it goes here then it goes here then it becomes here and again comes back to A. So, there is a continuous rotation here ok. So, A C here then when it is coming out it is B D then next cycle again it becomes uh, uh, I think C A and then next cycle it becomes D B and then another cycle it again becomes A C ok. So, it starts from A C then become B D and so on ok. So, continuously you are changing the position. So, every time the shear plane direction is changing ok. Then you have a root C ok in which case you, you suppose if this is your A plane and this is your C plane ok. Then next cycle uh, it will be C above and A below ok. So, it is like 180 degree rotation you are doing. So, one uh, configuration like this and next configuration is directly like this. So, shear plane is uh, getting 180 degree rotation every time ok. And ob obviously, when you are doing this kind of uh, uh, variations it is going to change the, uh, the microstructure which is going to be generated because your shear plane is continuously changing ok. So, there is there is a large amount of work on these uh, variations also that what is the effect of see amount of strain will be same now ok. So, the only change will come because of the uh, change in the shear plane ok and there is large amount of work on that how what will be the effect of these roots on the on the microstructure ok. Now, what are the effect of passes for example ok. So, you have one microstructure nice microstructures are shown in three dimensions as you can see 
Okay. So, uh, just to give you the idea about x, y and z, I will go back to a previous slide. Okay. So, this is what x, y, z is. Okay. So, x is this plane, y is this plane and z is this plane, okay, the top one. So, so, the shearing is taking place in this y plane okay, like this. So, this is what you can see in the y plane because of the shearing the, the grains are elongated okay, and also they are at a certain angle okay, which will be defined by the shear angle of the shear plane. Okay. The z in the z plane if you see all the grains are looking only as a kind of uh, compressed okay, uh, more or less equiased and compressed kind of. In the x plane you can see the elongated grains in this direction okay, because there you see the, the shearing taking place in y plane. So, these, these grains are getting elongated in the in, in this way. Okay. So, but the important is this particular y plane where the where because of shearing you have grains okay, aligned in a in the direction of the shear plane. Okay. Now, what will be the effect of passes using these roots? So, we are using root root B C. So, in root B C you are rotating uh, the, the, the plane every time. So, it is all the rotations are given to the plane. So, in 4 passes actually you have complete the whole cycle of deformation. So, shear plane has changed every time uh, and it has completed the whole 360 degree rotation. Okay. So, if you do that you can see the difference between the two microstructure. Okay. Here the microstru microstructure the grains are very coarse you can see the scale here 500 micron. Okay. So, very big grains elongated grains. Okay and aligned in the in, in the deformation direction whereas if you see after four passes okay the grain size is refined and the scale you can see it is 2 micron here okay and uh, more or less the grains are in that range okay so it should be more even less than 1 micron okay and in all the three planes the microstructure is looking uniform okay so, the, the, that is a very good way to if you want a uniform microstructure. Okay, if I follow this route B C, I should be able to get in 4 passes a very uniform ultra fine grain uh, microstructure. Okay. So, from 500 uh, like maybe like the grains must be around 100 to 200 micron you have reduced it to 2 micron order of magnitude difference in the grain size. Okay. Now, this is the effect of pressing speed. So, how fast I am uh, uh, pressing it okay? uh, that, that also will be a variable, okay? but uh, uh, in, in, the, in the literature we do not see much effect of the pressing speed on the for example, yield stress here. Okay? Microstructure is will of course, get refined. Okay? So, these are the number of passes. The, the circle open circle is first pass and the uh, inverted triangle is, is the fourth pass. So, obviously, as you increase the number of passes, number of passes is increasing is the, in this direction, my yield strength is increasing because I am refining the microstructure. Okay. So, from around 200 mega Pascal it is going up to 260 or 70 mega Pascal. However, there is not much change because of the the ram speed okay how fast i am forcing it to deform okay because and you can see that there is a order of magnitude difference between the strain rate uh, or the ram speed uh, which is in millimeter per second here from 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power 1 okay so a large uh, difference in the ram speed so strain rate will be quite different in, in each of these cases, but there is not much effect on the yield strength of the material because of that. Okay. So, mainly the strain is the, uh, is the more important parameter here for, uh, uh, for uh, altering the properties of the material through E cap process. Okay. Effect of pressing temperature okay, that at what temperature I am doing the deformation. Okay. So, if you see that uh, again this is E cap temperature in Kelvin and there is a grain size okay, and this data is for aluminum, aluminum, magnesium alloys and 
in one case scandium is also there ok. So, of course, the, there is uh, as the and the temperature is changing from 300 to 600 Kelvin. So, roughly around let us say up to 300 degree Celsius they are going uh, and uh, the grain size is uh, less than 1 micron in case of scandium containing alloy ok. For pure aluminum the grain size is ranging from 1 micron to around 4 or 5 micron ok. So, a uh, huge reduction in the grain size through E cap process ok and also the effect of temperature can be seen if temperature is more already we know that that when temperature of deformation is high ok you your grain size uh, which you achieve after the deformation process is is going to be high ok. So, this is the effect of temperature on the grain size. Another effect we already know about is what we call as adiabatic temperature rise ok that is when you deform a material ok because of the deformation already we have seen in case of uh, processing uh, maps that when you put in any power ok in terms of uh, like we are going to deform the material here ok some uh, will be going into microstructural change and some will be going in heating the material. So, this is the adiabatic temperature rise as a function of uh, uh, deformation ok and pressing speed is given as 18 mm per second here ok and the ambient temperature is around 11 degree Celsius. So, the adiabatic temperature rise in pure aluminum is around uh, around 30 degree Celsius ok. So, from 11 to it is going up to 40 and in different passes there is not much difference in the rise in the in the temperature ok. So, it is a very consistent process in that way. In uh, another alloy where you have 3 weight percent magnesium ok, uh, again pressing speed is same ok. Again you can see now the temperature rise is around 80 degrees Celsius from 11 or 13 in this case to around 90 ok. So, around 80 degree Celsius temperature rise is there ok. So, delta T here is around uh, I would say 30 degree Celsius and delta T here is around um, 80 degree Celsius ok. So, with the same pressing speed this is important here ok. You are able to achieve more temperature in case of a material which has some alloying element ok. So, we expect that when you have alloying element the the strength of material will be high ok. So, the temperature rise uh, uh, in, 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 in case of E cap depend on the strength of the material as well as uh, ram speed ok. So, as you increase the ram speed also there will be effect on the uh, temperature rise ok. So, ram speed is not affecting that much the yield strength. But when you are deforming the material uh, due to temperature rise there it may affect uh, slightly the microstructure of the material ok. So, now uh, all these things ultimately when you do anything like this processing to change the microstructure and so on uh, basically we ultimately do it to get some property ok. So, all this ultra fine grain material or production of ultra grain fine material is started with the Hall Patch relationship, which says that uh, if you keep reducing the grain size, the strength of material will increase, the yield strength, let us say, of the material will be keep increasing, ok, as a function of d to the power minus half, ok, that we know from Hall Patch relationship. So, the ultra fine grain material production of ultra, ultra fine grain material is started from the uh, Hall Page relationship that uh, let us increase the strength of material just by reducing the, uh, the grain size ok. So, what is the effect of all this E cap process on strength and ductility that, uh, uh, that is shown here in this graph ok. So, the on the x axis you have equivalent strain ok and y axis you have elongation to failure ok. So, equivalent strain means uh, already we have seen the relationship for the strain. So, that is the amount of strain which you are putting in the material and after putting different amount of strain ok, the strength of the material is is uh, noted down ok, the, the, 
dotted circle here gives the strength of the, the rolling. Okay. So, in rolling you can achieve maybe the maximum strain of around 2.2 or so okay, 2.2 or 2.4 whereas, in case of E cap you can go up to strain of 8 in this case in fact, you can go more also. So, what is the effect of this uh, imposition of a strain? Okay. So, the elongation uh, the, the yield strength is uh, on the other side. Okay. So, yield strength is increasing from 100 mega Pascal okay, to around 380 mega Pascal. So, big jump in the strength of the material by doing uh, by, by imposing uh, the strain through E cap process. Okay. Whereas, if you see the ductility, the re ductility reduces uh, substantially. So, okay, initial material the ductility was around 31 percent okay, and that got reduced to somewhere around 14 percent. So, almost uh, half the ductility, okay, but the strength is uh, more than uh, 3 times. So, this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, balance between strength and ductility is always there whenever you want to produce ultra fine grain materials okay, that although the strength increases following the hull patch relationship, but the ductility of the material reduces okay. and the, and the uh, reason for that is that the, when the plastic deformation is through generation and movement of dislocations, if, if you keep reducing the size. Okay, uh, the generation of dislocation becomes that much difficult okay and then the dislocation as a deformation mechanism will not be an effective mechanism as you in, reduce the uh, grain size okay so when it doesn't become a, a, a important mechanism then the problem comes that what will carry the deformation process okay so, if there is no other alternative deformation mechanism then the, then the ductility of the material will come down. So, though the strength is more because you now require much higher uh, much higher stresses to uh, generate dislocation or move dislocation because of the reduction in grain size uh, the ductility will reduce. Okay. So, there are now people have tried ways to improve the ductility okay, without compromising the strength. Okay. So, there are couple of approaches there. So, the first approach is that do not stop uh, grain refinement um, up to a certain level you keep reducing the grain size to even more smaller sizes okay. and with very high fraction of a high angle grain boundary. Okay. So, have a fine grain size with very high fraction of high angle grain boundaries. If you do that, then the deformation mechanism change from dislocation base to grain boundary sliding. Okay. Uh, if you remember grain boundary sliding, we discussed when we were discussing about the creep deformations. Okay. So, in creep and especially in super plasticity, the grain boundary sliding is a very important deformation mechanism. As, as, and as, as I told you that deformation will not be through dislocation movement within the grain, but the grain itself will have a rigid body or there will be a grain boundary sliding. Okay. So, grain 1 and grain 2 will have a, a, a movement relative to each other without having any uh, dislocation movement inside the grain. Okay. Some may some dislocation movement can be there to accommodate the uh, stress concentration, but mainly the deformation will be through grain boundary sliding. So, if dislocation is not uh, not uh, effective when you have fine grain material. So, you can uh, look for some alternate uh, deformation mechanism by uh, designing the microstructure okay, and that can be grain boundary sliding okay. and in grain boundary sliding the ductility can be very high which, which is possible in super plastic material also. The second approach is to have bimodal grain size arrangement uh, distribution. So, you have you, you can have fine grain as well as some few coarse grains okay. some proportion of fine and coarse grain can be there okay. and this combination of fine and coarse grain okay, will give you the required strength and ductility. Okay. So, the, the finer grain will provide you the strength okay, whereas, the coarser grain will provide you the stability during the deformation through 
uh, dislocation movement. Okay, so this is another approach to have uh, to compensate for the reduction in ductility. So both the strength and ductility will be high. Okay, when you have bimodal grain size distribution. Okay, so these are the few uh, basic uh, ideas about uh, equal channel angular pressing. Of course, this is not a very exhaustive lecture. Okay, but if you are interested, a lot of literature is available. Okay, and you can start uh, working on that. Okay, so with that, I uh, will uh, uh, close the, the this particular uh, lecture on ECAP. Okay, so thank you for your attention.